All right, so uh, given that, um, let's see here. I wanna start out with this question. This is basically asking, uh, we have a dachshund here on a little uh, rail here. And we're asking how far up this ladder can the dachshund climb uh, without the ladder starting to slip. Uh, there are a series of forces here uh, that are keeping track of the, uh, the keeping the ladder in place. This is a static equilibrium problem. There's a force from the wall, which I'll just call FW. There's a force of friction uh, that's keeping it in place at the bottom. And that's the thing we're actually using to constrain the problem. So this is a static friction force here. Uh, we have a normal force pressing up, and we have a weight from the dachshund pressing down. So like all static uh, problems, we have two conditions that we are going to use to solve the problem. We're going to use the condition that the sum of the forces in both directions is equal to zero. And that the sum of the torques is equal to zero. Uh, by the way, could somebody just type in chat uh, that they hear me okay? Thank you. All right. Oh, man, everybody can hear. This is fantastic. All right, we're moving on. Uh, so the, uh, let's see here. So let's start out by figuring out the sum of the forces in the x direction. Uh, so the sum of the, we have one force down here. That's the friction force that's pushing to the right. And then we have the wall force pushing to the left. So we're going to say that the static friction force uh, minus the wall force is going to be zero. And then vertically, we have two forces. We have the normal force pushing up and the dachshund force pushing down. So we have a normal going up and the dachshund's weight going down. Uh, I'll just call that W because I didn't give it a variable. Okay, uh, and so given these two things, uh, we can go ahead and say that the static friction force is going to be have a magnitude that's equal to the wall force. And we also have that the normal force is equal to the weight. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, a question came up. There's no mg of the ladder. That's right. The uh, problem uh, actually specifies that the ladder is massless. That's a good question. Um, so uh, given that we have our two pieces, we've used our forces here. Uh, we're going to be solving this in the just starts to slip case. So in that case, we're going to say that the static friction force, which can have any magnitude at once up to a maximum, but we're going to say that it's actually at the maximum because that's the criterion here. So this is uh, friction force at the maximum. Uh, so that's as much as it can possibly hold. Uh, so the final piece is to put together the torques here. We have an angle theta. Uh, and so what's going to happen here is we need to calculate the torques uh, from uh, two forces. So I'm going to pick my origin for torques down here at the base of the ladder. So I'm going to pick this here as uh, torque origin. So this is where I'm going to have my moment arm. I pick that because I have two forces down here that I don't want to deal with. Uh, and you basically put the torque origin anywhere that you have uh, uh, forces you want to get rid of. And so we'll have the mg, uh, the mg from the dachshund and the wall uh, force that are going to give us our two lever arms. So let's start out by sketching out the uh, forces for uh, the torque vector for, or the torque uh, for the wall force. So I draw the vectors tail to tail. Uh, so I have my lever arm, this is the ladder length going up here. And then I have FW, that's the wall force pushing back the other way. Given the problem, this is the angle theta here. And so this angle here is going to be the supplement of it. And so it's gonna have a magnitude of 180 degrees minus theta. And therefore the torque from the wall is going to be equal to L F sine of the angle between the two vectors. That's the 180 degrees minus theta. Degrees minus theta. And I'm gonna cut straight to the chase here because I happen to know a trig identity that that thing is equal to LF sine theta. Uh, so that's a uh, uh, trig identity. Okay, so from there, uh, I can go ahead and fit, ooh, this is an exciting thing that I didn't know much about OneNote to deal with. Um, yeah, 
What the hell? Seriously. Okay, I've done something truly crazy here. All right, um, great. So let's see if I can be really cramped here. Then we're going to say that the torque uh, from the, uh, uh, the other thing is the torque from the dachshund, the torque from the dachshund pushing down is gonna have a form that looks like this. Oh geez, where to put this crap? Okay, so then we have a leather arm that's going up, that's the magnitude X, that then we're going to have a weight from the dachshund going down, that's the MG. Uh, you may remember the bicycle pedal problem from the content quiz, this is the same geometry. All right. Um, is that me or somebody annotating this? Anyways, yeah, somebody annotating this. That's something that I didn't shut off. So yeah, have fun with that. Uh, so then we have an angle theta there. And so the total angle between the two vectors there is going to be equal to x times mg times the sine of the 90 degrees plus the theta. Uh, so we can take that uh, 90 degrees, plus, uh, that's the 90 degrees here, and then the theta angle there. And so then we're going to say from, again, a trig identity that this is mg uh, cos theta. And I should stick in here that this is a negative sign. So I'm going to say this is times negative 1. Now is this going to continue to scroll with me? Yes. All right. Goodbye. All right. Um, OK. Uh, so given that, let's uh, go ahead and select all this mess. Let's go ahead and select all this mess. Let's go ahead and compare it. Uh, Declare a complete bankruptcy on everything that's done on this page and uh, uh, just call and abort. Okay, so let's uh, draw a new page and hope that the future is better than the past. All right. <sighs> All right, I've got, you know, I love computers. One sec, I'll be right back. Hmm. All right, picking up here. We had a relationship where we had that the uh, normal force for the dachshund uh, was equal to, or the normal force from the ground was equal to mg. We had that the force from the wall was equal to the static friction force, and that that was equal to mu s times the normal force, because we were at the maximum case here. Let's make that into an actual m. Oh, geez. And then we figured out that there were two torques in the problem. So the, the sum of the torques here was going to be equal to negative mgx cos theta. And then the other one was going to be plus the force of the wall uh, times L times sine theta. And then this mess was equal to zero. So given uh, these pieces, we could go ahead and solve that mgx cos theta was equal to the force of the wall, L sine theta. Uh, and from there, we could figure out that X is equal to the force of the wall times L sine theta over mg cos theta. Uh, the trig becomes a tangent theta. And then we use that the force of the wall is equal to mu s times the normal force and that the normal force is equal to mg. So let me just write that all out. So we get that the force of the wall is equal to mu s times n, and that's equal to mu s times mg. 
Uh, so we're going to go ahead and put that in there. So we get mu s m g l over m g. Oh, no cos theta because it's gone. And so then we are left with, believe it or not, mu s l tan theta. All right. So that's the actual solution to the problem. We can go ahead and chunk in all the pieces there. All right. OK, um, let's see here. So that gives us uh, the expression here. Uh, Sam, uh, you need to hit the connect to audio button, I guess. Sorry, that, that now I realize that that doesn't work. All right, let's see here. Chantal asks, how can you identify what is considered a torque? So in the case of the Dachshund um, problem, I'm considering this to be a torque here because I know that we have, this, is, uh, this ends up being a statics problem. Uh, so the reason why I know it's a statics problem is I have an extended object that I'm considering here uh, with the forces uh, that are pushing uh, at different parts of the body. So we have a force that is in, uh, we have the forces from the wall, the dachshund, and the friction force and the normal force all act in separate parts of this object. And therefore, we're going to have to worry about them uh, as torques here. OK. Um, OK. And then we also got a question. I can explain again why n is equal to mg. Well, the, that was from the uh, forces in the vertical direction, the mg is balanced by the normal force of the ground pushing up. Uh, similarly, the friction force and the wall force oppose each other. This is the weird thing about statics problems is that the forces act on different parts of the body, uh, but nonetheless, they do the whole free body diagram treatment where you can reduce this to a single free body diagram with four forces pushing in four different directions. All right. Um, yeah, so if there was a no object on the ladder and the ladder had mass, then it would be a regular forces problem. Actually, what happens here if it's the ladder doesn't have, um, if the ladder has mass and we have the same setup, uh, what you get is that there's a weight force from the ladder uh, that acts at its geometric center, at the center of mass. And so we would actually solve the same problem, except here the x would be equal to L over 2. And then I'd have to ask a different question, like what's the minimum coefficient of static friction to keep it from slipping or something like that. So we could solve it at the case of a massive ladder. Uh, is this a transference question? Oh, very much yes. Uh, if you haven't seen the question before and it involves a lot of calculation, it's probably a transference question. All right. So, um, yeah, torques, they're great. Okay, uh, we have a question on spring final one and uh, spring final two and three. So let's uh, chunk out a new page here and uh, see what the future holds. Uh, so questions two, and, oh, that's totally a midterm. You don't care about that because you're amazing at all those problems. Um, let's see here, spring, final, uh, we better have answers. Okay. Ah, so yeah, this is, yes, yes. Let's see. All right, so the question on this was uh, spring final question two. Uh, was asking about uh, this problem, which is basically which one of the axes so indicated uh, would have the smallest angular acceleration if you spin around. Uh, so this is getting at the first, uh, the first equation is to remember that the angular acceleration uh, in one of these rotation problems is set by the torque. Well, I guess we're in blue today. Uh, torque is equal to I alpha. So we're asking which one, it has a constant torque. So we say that the torque is constant. And then we have alpha here. And alpha is, we want this to be small. So in that case, this is basically tantamount, meaning it's the same thing as asking what's the largest moment of inertia. 
So given that, we have to remember how to calculate the moment of inertia. And if we're doing that, uh, the way we do that is we find the rotation axes. Let's say we're calculating the moment of inertia around axis A. What we do is we have to find the distance or the moment of inertia is I around axis A. I guess I'll indicate that that way. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna multiply that. It's the sum of the mass times the distance from the axis uh, squared. So this is a sum and we're using I as an indexing variable here. So that just means I add up all the masses times the distance squared. In this case, we have a case where it's 3m is a mass, but it's sitting on the rotation axis. So that's zero squared, that doesn't contribute. Uh, m times zero squared also doesn't contribute. And then we have plus uh, 2m, times the 2d quantity squared. And so this ends up just being 8md squared. Uh, you can calculate it for axis B. And if you do that, you get the 3m. That 3m is a distance of 2d from here to here. So again, that's 2d quantity squared plus m times uh, 2d quantity squared. Uh, so this ends up being, uh, uh, I, can, I can math, uh, 3, 12, uh, 16, 16, this seems big, and d squared. Yeah, all right, I guess we're, yeah, all right, don't panic, it's 16. Uh, I see, and then from here, you might be able to see that this is just going to be m d squared, uh, plus, uh, again, from axis C, so we measure m to d squared, and then we measure 2m d squared. So when you're doing these, the important, distant, uh, important thing to keep in mind, or one of the many important things to keep in mind, is that the distance that you're measuring is the distance from the rotation axis, shortest perpendicular distance down to where the object is. So it's, you're not measuring from a single point, you're measuring from anywhere along the rotation axis to the different masses here. So, you know, a, a question comes up. So the objective is just to find the radius of each mass and use to calculate the total inertia of each axis. Yes, that's, uh, that's basically the gist of it. And so you have to remember that the radius comes in squared here. And so we can work through all of these. And it turns out that the answer B is the one with the largest uh, and the, uh, the largest value of the moment of inertia. So that's why we have that as the answer here. Uh, largest moment of inertia, smallest angular acceleration, and uh, yeah, that's, that's then the answer. Uh, the other question came up was answer three. Uh, so this is, um, I'll just copy paste the whole thing in here because Microsoft still hasn't figured out how PDFs work. Um, it's going to be blurry, but you'll get the gist. So the next question was, the ball is thrown straight up from the surface of the Earth with air resistance. It takes t seconds to reach the top, t2 to fall back down. How does t1 compare to t2? The answer is here that it takes longer to fall down than it takes to go up. So if I think about this just in terms of the time to go up, and then the time to come back down, so this is T1 goes up, and then T2 to go down. This is secretly a work energy problem. Uh, the reason why uh, it is, is that the, um, we always have the amount of energy in the system is decreasing. So we have the energy from the bottom of the trajectory. So this, let's call the initial case of the energy the throw. And this is the top of the trajectory. So from the bottom to the top of the trajectory, there's been a non-conservative work done on this system. So this is going to be, I'm going to indicate as negative. So this just means that there's less energy at the top than at the bottom. So even though we're going up and we're transforming into kinetic energy, at every point along the trajectory, the ball is slowing down. Uh, and so we are constantly losing kinetic energy. So if we think about this as it goes from the top, uh, to the bottom, and then again from the, uh, and then we'll consider the bottom uh, case down here, where we have final uh, minus initial. Again, there's going to be a non-conservative work done on it. And in this case, we'll consider the final to be at the bottom. And then the initial will be at the top. 
we end up with a situation that as it's going down, it has lower kinetic energy than uh, when it was going up. So that's the heart of this problem, is that the kinetic energy at any point, I'm gonna just type, is uh, any point on the downward side is larger, the smaller and the same point going up. Since the kinetic energy is equal to the speed, it's traveling slower on the way down than on the corresponding point on the way up. So therefore, it must have taken more time. Okay. Um, yeah, so those are those two. Moving on, um, I got a question to do a car going around a banked curve. There's actually a full YouTube video uh, that works through all of this. All I'm going to do is just sort of set up the car around the bank per problem and talk about how to solve it. Uh, you can go ahead and pick up the pieces from the notes or the YouTube channel to see all the gory heinous algebra. But this is an important question about a car going around a banked curve. Yeah, it's a car. So uh, there's wheels on it and everything. Uh, so this is a side view of a car going down. And so it's approaching us going uh, towards us. Uh, so the what's happening is oh sorry i'm gonna go back just briefly somebody asked if would the times be equal if the go, ball going up ball going down took place in a vacuum yes all right now returning to this uh uh returning to this case uh this is a case where there's a car going around a corner uh a banked curve so the car is coming towards you uh car is coming toward you uh, so it has uh, with some speed b. So this is just a limitation of my terrible drawing skills. And uh, there's an angle theta. And we want to understand uh, basically what's the minimum maximum speeds that we could have a car going around the corner. Um, actually, I'm going to ask specifically about 6 16, which may be the frictionless one. Yeah, it's the frictionless one. So this makes it even nicer. Okay, so uh, there is no friction. I'm going to set up a coordinate system here. And the key point with the coordinate system is we have an X and a Y coordinate here. And for most ramp problems, I would pick the coordinate system to be parallel and perpendicular to the ramp. So I would normally pick something that looks like this, but because this is a rotation problem, this is the trick to this problem, the acceleration in this problem, it's going around a corner, there has to be a centripetal acceleration pointing towards the center of the curve. And the first rule for picking coordinate axes is try to align your acceleration along one of the coordinate axes. Uh, and then from there, you can sort of work on decomposing forces. But uh, for here, you want to pick it going horizontally uh, there. Uh, so there's no friction and we want to know basically uh, what's the angle we bank the curve at. So find theta. Uh, so to find the angle, uh, this is just for context, example 6-16 in the book. Uh, so find the angle uh, theta and so what we're going to do is we'll set up a free body diagram. We have a normal force going up, we have an mg going down, and that is absolutely everything. Uh, so all we need to do now is decompose our forces. Um, so we have a uh, centripetal acceleration going into the center. And then that angle theta and this angle uh, therefore is theta. And so the car is not sliding up and down. So we have the sum of the forces in the y direction must be zero. And so that's the normal force cos theta uh, minus mg. Uh, the sum of the forces in the x direction must equal to the mass times the acceleration, which is the centripetal acceleration, mv squared over r. So ma is mv squared over r. And the only force that's providing that is the horizontal component of the normal force. So that's the n sine theta. At this point, it's all over but the algebra and the shouting. So then we have n cos theta is equal to mg. That's from this equation comes down, becomes that. I'm going to use that and solve uh, that n is equal to mg divided by cos theta. And so then we're going to take that n 
and we're going to continue heading up into this equation. And when we do that, we get that uh, mv squared over r is equal to n. Uh, oop, I'm actually replacing n. That was the whole point of existing, or at least doing this chunk of math. So that's mg uh, over cos theta uh, times sine theta. Oh my, and this is equal to mg tan theta. Let's massacre some variables. There goes an m. And then we can go ahead and we can solve that. Uh, let's see here. We get v squared over rg is equal to tan theta. And that's a great opportunity to use an arctangent function. OK, let's see if we got any questions. OK, why isn't the centripetal acceleration down the ramp? So this is a key point about ex uh, centripetal acceleration. I'll type it out here. Remember, uh, centripetal acceleration always points, points straight toward the rotation axis. So straight horizontal across towards the rotation axis. Uh, next question is, how long is the in-person review on Monday? I'll be doing a two-hour review starting at 10 and CSIS 1-440. Our fine friends from A02 will be taking their exam then. Uh, so why is theta in the vertical and not the horizontal? So that is, why is this angle here theta as opposed to this theta? So that's, uh, that's the sort of geometry of the problem. So if I think about what's happening here with this vector here, if this is theta, uh, I can construct a line here so that this is theta uh, because these are two parallel lines. And so those are alternate interior angles of parallel lines. And then, uh, so then this is a right angle because it's a normal force. So this angle here is 90 degrees minus theta. And then this angle up here is going to be the theta. Uh, why, uh, choo, 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 is there no angle F just, uh, yeah, so there's no friction, just the normal force. OK. Um, yep. All right. Uh, so. Moving on, all the way back to the top of the scrolling. Uh, zero torque and static equilibrium, finding horizontal. Uh, so I think with the Dachshund problem, we've addressed a statics problem. So I'm going to put that on hold. We can do another one later. Uh, but I'd like to cycle back and see some questions about uh, uh, spring final 13 and uh, 19. OK, so uh, these are, ooh hands down the hardest problems on the exam. I'm very excited about these. Uh, so without further ado. So one of the questions was this. Uh, hollow ball with uh, mass is sliding along with initial speed. This is, uh, this is one of those hardcore transference problems. Uh, and so I'm actually going to set it up. And I'm, I'm not going to execute it all the way. I'll leave the algebra there. And the reason being, this was a great transference question, but I'm not going to ask this transference question. Uh, but the key concepts, I want to go over the physics, because the physics is important. Working through the algebra for this problem, not so great. Uh, and I, will, I, I, I owe some people some Piazza answers on this as well. So I'll fill out some more algebra there. Anyways, so we have a ball that's going along. It's enjoying its uh, travel. It is sliding on a uh, frictionless surface. So it has no angular acceleration. And then it hits this area with a uh, constant friction of co, uh, co of co a non-zero coefficient of kinetic friction. Words, yeah. OK, and so at this point, we want to know basically how far will it travel from here until it starts rolling without slipping. So at this point, the ball is traveling this way with an initial speed v, but it has omega is uh, equal to zero. So it's just sliding along like everything happy in chapter two or chapter six would occur. But then we're going to encounter this friction and it's going to start rolling. So let's think about what is happening to the ball when it actually encounters the friction force. There's some forces that are acting on it. We have a normal force from the uh, ground. We have a weight force that's going down. And then we have a kinetic friction force heading back this way. And our kinetic friction model always works. So we have Fk 
is equal to mu k times n. So this is kind of a cool situation because we have a force and we have a torque on the problem. And the reason that's important is the force is going to slow down the ball, but the torque is going to cause the ball to start spinning. So we have this case where the torque, some of the torques, that's a torque, is going to lead to an angular acceleration. It's going to lead to an angular acceleration and that the sum of the forces is going to be equal to the mass times the acceleration. And it's kind of weird because you can have one force, just for reference, that's the friction force, doing both the decelerating and the torque. Uh, it, it's not like it can only do one or the other, it just goes and does both. So given that, um, so let's see here. Uh, Given that, let's actually look at and figure out what the torque is. So we got the torque as the friction force actually happens at the bottom. It's uh, got a radius uh, there, that's R. And so the torque from that is going to be F sub K times R, and they act at 90 degree angles. So that's going to be uh, just have sine of one, as so the torque is just F K times the radius. And we know that that's mu K M g times r. And that's because I secretly replaced n equal to mg. I'll go ahead and chop that in there because, you know, we're completists. Okay, so this is going to be equal to the moment of inertia. What kind of ball was it? It was hollow. So that means that this is 2 thirds m r squared times alpha. And so then I can go ahead and say that this is alpha is equal to mu k m g r over two thirds m r squared. And then I went ahead and I did some serious canceling here. There's the masses, one of the radii goes away. And so we get, um, I was calling this beta in the solution. So I'll just leave that as a beta. So that two thirds is going to be the beta in this case. So then that's the mu k g over beta r. Okay, so this is nice because we get a nice compact form for the angular acceleration alpha. Uh, and I will note that I am only considering the magnitudes of these accelerations. This would formally be a negative. So I'm going to note, uh, it's, I think I end up in that situation again. All right, so we're in that case where I have somehow managed to bring along all the text. I don't use OneNote very often, if that's not obvious. All right, uh, so anyways, let me see what I can try to say. All right, uh, so note, uh, ignore the signs. Okay, we're gonna have this bit of stuff come along for a little longer. Uh, before I call a complete and total uh, abort here. Okay, so the thing to remember now that we have our angular acceleration is that we can then go and figure out the forces. Uh, the forces uh, are just F equals MA. So there's only one force in the horizontal direction. That's uh, FK is equal to mu uh, K times uh, N is equal to mu K M G and that's equal to the mass times the acceleration. And we'll cancel that out. And we get that A is just equal to mu K times G. Okay, so that gives us our two accelerations. We have A, uh, A is equal to mu K G, and we have alpha is equal to mu K uh, G over beta R. The thing that you want to remember with all of this is that these two aren't equal and there's no relationship between them until we get the case of, uh, we're going to end up in the case where we have um, V is equal to R omega. This is when the problem ends. So this is the end condition. That's the rolling without slipping. But there isn't a relationship between angular and linear acceleration initially because they are not actually coupled. And this is what made this into a transference problem, is that we had never seen a case where we hadn't really 
explored rolling without slipping before. And so that, and it also ends up being the hardest problem on the uh, exam as a result. Uh, okay, so given these two pieces, um, I want to go ahead and uh, sort of say the final piece that you need to uh, put this together is that then we then just go into the kinetic, uh, the kinematics equations, and where we say that the velocity at a or speed at any given time is the initial speed, and it's going to be slowing down, so it's minus mu k g times t. So this is, uh, this is AT, acceleration times time. And we also have a relationship for the angular speed. So that's equal to zero plus the angular acceleration, which is mu k g over beta r. And we want to get to the case where this v minus v naught minus mu k g t is equal, oh, sorry, I forgot the time, because this is equal to, uh, this is this chunk here is the angular acceleration alpha. All we're doing is we're trying to get through to the case where uh, there is this relationship, V is equal to R omega. So our strategy moving forward, and this is the part I'm not gonna do, uh, is basically um, find T so that V is equal to R omega. And so that would be the case where then the two things are rolling with, or the two uh, velocities are related and it's rolling without slipping. Um, and so then it will just roll forward. Um, and that's the end condition. So find the time so that's true. And then you can go ahead and sub that into the kinematics equations to figure out how far it's traveled. All right, so that's all I'm gonna say about that. I'm in sort of the part where the text comes along with me for some reason and even comes to new pages. It's all very exciting. Uh, so. Uh, I'm going to apply, uh, I'm going to employ what I like to affectionately call the nuclear option uh, and uh, start the next question. All right. Um, let's see here. Let's find my chat again. All right. So that was a question about um, Spring Final 13. Uh, we can also do Spring Final 19, which is, I think, um, at least from my limited perspective on exams, uh, kind of a better question for uh, creating uh, a problem. So uh, yeah, so this is the question uh, where we have a sheep on a block, uh, moving forward, uh, hitting a spring, and then the sheep starts to slip. We really want to figure out how far the spring is compressed from its equilibrium when the uh, sheep starts to slip with respect to the block. What this is getting at um, in terms of the physics is we're basically saying that the spring is going to exert a force, and there's going to come a uh, and it's going to slow down the block plus uh, sheep uh, sort of pair uh, until a point where the acceleration on the sheep is going to be too large for the static friction force to provide. So what you have to remember here is the force from a spring is going to have a magnitude equal to kx. Uh, so the question is, is this a transference question? This is also a transference question. Uh, yes, so, the, uh, so what we're finding here is basically as the spring uh, gets compressed more, the acceleration is going to uh, increase because bigger compression, bigger force, bigger force, bigger, uh, 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 bigger acceleration, and then the friction force can't maintain it. So we have, um, we have the case where we have a spring. Uh, let's consider just the sheep. So here's the sheep. Uh, the sheep has a mass of M1g, or a weight pulling down, has a normal force, and then when it's slowing down, what it's doing is it has the static friction force is the force that's actually slowing it. Uh, and so what this is, we're actually, uh, it will start to slip in the case. So the slip happens when the static friction force is equal to the max static friction force, uh, which is equal to mu s times the normal force, uh, which is equal to mu s 
mg. And so the max acceleration that it can encounter is equal to um, uh, fs is equal to m times a is equal to mu s m g. So if I cancel out those, I get the max acceleration is a max is equal to mu s m g. So the reason why this is a transference problem is this is kind of chapter uh, six reasoning. I have to sort of think about, oh, what are the forces and the accelerations until a static friction model breaks? But then I have to figure out what the maximum or what the acceleration is in uh, the system. And the system turns out to be a simple harmonic oscillator uh, because it's compressing here. And so I actually have an expression here for the um, uh, accelerator or, or the force exerted. Uh, Oh, I did already cancel out the mouse. Man, thank you all so much. You guys are great. Oops. Uh, yeah, goodbye. Goodbye, mouse. Um, yeah. All right. So the acceleration is equal to just the static friction times the gravitational constant. So we want to figure out when this spring force is providing that acceleration onto uh, the sheet. I guess we don't actually need full simple harmonic oscillator powers because we only care about the distance here. Uh, so therefore, the friction, uh, the spring force is going to be equal to uh, k times the compression distance. And that is going to equal to the force provided onto both of these, which is going to be, we're going to treat it as an ensemble system, m1 plus m2 uh, times g. And so this is equal to, oh, oh times the acceleration. Yes. Um, uh, times the acceleration. And so then the, uh, compression, which has a given accelerator, or sorry, the acceleration for a given compression is equal to m1 plus m2. And we're going to equate that to the, the max acceleration, which is mu s uh, mg. And then we're going to go ahead and find out what that is uh, by basically saying x is equal to m1 plus m2 all over k uh, times, uh, Thank you. I'm just, I, I really want to keep this mass here, but it's, that, it doesn't belong. Um, oh, yeah. So. <sighs> Go away, mass. Okay. Call it complete abort on this. Mu s times g. Uh, right, so it's k1 over 2 mu s times g. So then we can go ahead and figure out what this compression is. Then uh, the only thing that we really need to worry about after this is um, worrying about whether this sheep actually reaches this distance um, when we plug in all these values. And the answer is yes. Uh, and you would figure out whether the total kinetic energy, so one of the answers is the sheep will never slip off the block. And you do have to check that you can get this will grind out, I think, to be about 14 meters with values given in the problem. Uh, and what you need to do is basically figure out what the maximum compression of the sheep is, which you can figure out from the kinetic energy, 1 half m1 plus m2 uh, times v squared is equal to uh, the maximum compression, uh, maximum spring energy is one half Ka squared, uh, which is sort of the amplitude of the simple harmonic motion. And when you do this, this checks out to be about 15 meters uh, to find you know, the amplitude of the motion is about 15 meters. So you will get a case where the sheep will slip. Okay. Yeah, could I just repeat that? So yeah, what all I'm saying here is that uh, we have to figure out it basically says that I have to compress the sheep for 14 meters uh, before the sheep uh, will actually experience an acceleration large enough for it to slip off of the block. And it's not clear, given the initial speed given in the problem of 10 meters per second, that it has enough energy to compress that spring. So we have to figure out the maximum compression for the spring. And we do that by setting the initial kinetic energy equal to the spring potential energy. A here represents the amplitude of the motion. So I'm using the variables from the simple harmonic motion case. Uh, and so this is actually just the max, the max compression. Oops. 
max compression. Man, yeah, that. All right. Um, so why is FS going to the left instead of the right? So I've picked FS to be going to the left uh, because that's the direction that the acceleration is going. If the velocity is here and then it's slowing down, the acceleration will be going in this direction. And the sheep's, uh, the only horizontal force accelerating the sheep is the static friction. Uh, so if the compression is less than 14 meters, then the sheep wouldn't slip off. Yeah, if I had given you like a five meter per second speed up here, then it would not reach this speed uh, or it would not reach the compression where it would have the acceleration that would drive the sheep to fall off. Uh, will it still work if you flip the signs for both? Probably, yeah, probably. Um, so yeah, because math is more forgiving than physics. Um, let's see here. So is A already given or do we have to calculate? We do have to calculate it and that's done from this energy calculation. All right. So I think I am bringing text along again when I scroll. Oh, no, hey, it's back. Awesome. It froze. Okay. Let's add a page and see what the chat would like. The chat wants an A. Everybody knows that. Um, uh, so let's see here, question on spring final, uh, question seven. And it looks a little something like this. This is a good conceptual question here. So. A car and a truck are traveling toward each other on a straight line and collide perfectly inelastically. Which of the following statement is true about the magnitudes of the energy and momentum? Uh, so the, this is a case. So we, the, the first thing is we have a key here. For, uh, they collide perfectly inelastically. So perfectly inelastically means that they stick together afterwards. So we can basically equate the two momenta. Uh, I'll be honest, if you see two things colliding, it's either a projectile motion problem uh, where they're hitting in the air or it's a momentum problem. So you should immediately be like, ah, this is a momentum problem. So we know that the momenta of these cases, uh, I'm going to draw them with vectors, are going to collide with each other uh, before, and that's going to be equal to the single momentum of the object afterwards. I'm going to pick the car to be going to the, uh, this is going to the uh, right, and the truck will be going to the left. And I'm going to pick this to be the positive direction, this to be the negative direction. And then I can just write this as three M, oh, sorry, uh, let's see here. It's mass of the car, speed of the car, plus, uh, oh, let's call it a minus, uh, minus mass of the truck, speed of the truck is equal to mass of the truck plus mass of the car, speed final. So yes, we're getting down to, do the car and the truck have the same initial momentum? Absolutely. So we have three, uh, the car is three, uh, you just multiply these numbers, three MV here, three MV. Uh, the truck is going to be minus three MV. Uh, so they're ending up with a total speed of zero. So this is basically saying they come and they stick together and they go to rest. So then we can basically figure out what happens here where each of these change. So essentially all of the kinematic quantities are going to be uh, averaged out. So the change in momentum for the car, so the change in momentum for the car, it goes from three MV to zero, so it's going to have a change of 3 mv. The change in momentum for the truck is going to be the same, 3 mv, because it goes from 3 mv to zero. Uh, then we have to look at the energy. So the change in the kinetic energy for the car is going to be, it goes to zero, it's coming from 1 half times mass times 3v squared, and so that's going to be 9 halves mv squared. The change in kinetic energy for the truck is going to be one half times three m times v squared. So that's just going to be three halves m v squared. 
so you can see that the change in energy for the truck uh, is going to be smaller than the change of energy for the car. So the changes in momentum are equal, and the changes in energy for the car is larger than the change of energy for the truck. So that's how uh, we would approach the problem. It's a cl classic um, conceptual problem because it involves a little bit of knowledge of the equations, but there aren't real numbers that you have to evaluate to an answer. You just have to understand the scalings here. A uh, question came up of how do we know that VF is equal to zero? I got that from the perfectly inelastic collision case where I know that they go and stick together. They have equal and opposite momenta, so they hit each other, they stick, and then they go ahead and end up with uh, zero um, uh, final momentum. Since the mass didn't go anywhere, that just means the speed is zero. All right. Um, Let's see here. Uh, sample final 11. Ooh, a superb owl. All right. Uh, so question is, what does perfectly inelastic mean? Um, this is one of those key vocabulary words. Uh, perfectly inelastic means that they hit and stick. So right up here means uh, afterwards they collide and stick together. In that case, energy is definitely not conserved, uh, but momentum is always conserved in these collisions. Uh, and there is no friction in the problem. They just stick together straight up. We are, we are ignoring that. Uh, so what is the final kinetic energy for both? It is straight up zero for everything because they are at rest. Um, if momentum wasn't equal, would you find the resulting vector? Yes, and you absolutely could do this problem uh, if the thing is not moving. It would just be a bit harder for the math, um, but the principles would all be the same, and you have to compare them before and after in both cases. All right, um, this question came up of a superb owl uh, on the frictionless bowl, sliding down towards the center. What happens, what is the free body diagram for the owl at the bottom of the uh, trajectory? Uh, this is, uh, I like this problem because it gets at something that is frequently a misconception in uh, uh, students of physics 124. So I always am going to ask something like this on the final. <clears throat> hint. Uh, so what happens is as we're coming down here, the owl is here on a circular track. So it's moving on a circular trajectory. And as such, you really know that there is a centripetal acceleration pointing towards the center of the circle. That centripetal acceleration must come from unbalanced forces. The ice is frictionless. So that tells you that there's no friction forward or backward. And so all we're doing is we're drawing the forces. There's one force up, that's the normal force. That's totally an arrow going up, trust me, I'm a scientist. And then there's a weight going down. And so the reason why it's E instead of say D or B is that you need there to be an unbalanced force pointing towards the center of the circle. If it's pointing towards the center of the circle, that means that the normal force minus mg is going to be greater than zero. So it's pointing in this uh, towards the center direction. So that's why the answer has to be E instead of B or D. It's not C because what's this force? There's not a force here. There's no sort of force from the forward motion of this. That's the velocity vector of the uh, force. Uh, there's nothing Part, you know, pushing it forward. Uh, there was no L flatulence or anything. So it's just frictionless and sliding down towards the center. Okay, how would the friction answer change if friction were present? Uh, in that case, you're, if there was friction, it would be in the opposite of the direction of motion. So there would still be a normal force going up, but then we would have a kinetic friction force going backwards. So again, we'd have N and we'd have MG. N would be bigger than MG. Uh, because you need the acceleration towards the center. Question came up, does n e, uh, is, you know, is the, is um, m times a c always equal to n minus mg? Uh, always? And the answer is no. Uh, you could consider this in, an, in the opposite case, um, which is what happens if this owl was on top of a dome yeah, 
and it's right up here, and it's going that way. In that case, it's on a circular path. Um, so that's, I should say, that's the velocity vector. In that case, it's on a circular path. And so its centripetal acceleration is pointing towards the center of the circle again. So this is a case where the free body diagram would be the case of D, where you would have mg going down and the normal force going up. And so that's given, that gives the uh, case where uh, then the net vector will be pointing down because you need an unbalanced set of forces pointing towards the center of the circle. So the force that is aligned with the centripetal acceleration will always be larger? Yes, that's exactly right. Um, you need a net force pointing to provide that acceleration, right? Accelerations come from unbalanced forces, and those unbalanced forces have to be pointing towards the center of the circle. Uh, so you can have these cases. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if you're on a circular path, like you're, you know, this is a car viewed going from the top. Uh, then the centripetal acceleration is going to be pointing in towards the center, uh, and the speed will be going this way. So it's always just pointed that way. And this tells you that somehow, somewhere, there's a force that's pointing in towards the center of the circle. There's net forces. Could be accelerating, decelerating as well. That'll give you other parts, but there is at least one force pointing towards the center of the circle. Uh, the direction is tricky because we've been working the constant velocity cases. So remember, another one of my favorite questions is what happens if you're going around the corner and there's a speed as well as a tangential acceleration. Uh, that's, that's supposed to be a T. Uh, and then there's also a uh, centripetal acceleration. In this case, the force has to be pointed in the vector sum of these two directions. Okay. So given that, uh, da, 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 da. all right. Um, we also got asked for a couple of blocks on a string. Okay, uh, so we have, a th uh, these are two blocks um, running over a pulley, uh, mass one uh, is on the table, uh, block two is uh, suspended, I want to find the tension here in the spring. Uh, so you can do this by uh, basically sum of forces uh, using the same principles that we have from chapter, I guess this would be six. So what we're going to do is we'll construct free body diagrams for the two masses. So we have mass one, and that has a tension force going this way. And then it has a normal force going up and a mass going down. Those two balance, and they turn out not to be important to it, uh, in the problem. M2 uh, has two forces on it, a tension force going up and a weight going down. The hard part in these problems is picking a direction for your coordinate systems and your acceleration. I'm going to go ahead and solve it in the full and gory detail, uh, and then I'll talk about the quick shortcut. I need to define uh, coordinate axes. So I'm going to go ahead and pick my positive axes for M1 to look like this, where there's an X and there's a Y. And then here, I'm going to pick the coordinate system here to be going downward. So there's a Y here and an X going this way. The reason why I'm doing this is I have a tension force is equal to mass one times the acceleration of block one in the X direction. And then if I do this, I get M2G minus the tension force is equal to the mass of two acceleration of block two in the Y direction. And where I'm really beating towards is that this accelerations must be the same. And the reason is, is if the block uh, one moves in this distance by some, or that direction by some direction, uh, by some distance, then this block two will drop by the same distance. I'll call that D just because we have X's and Y's running around in the problem. And that means the motions of these two blocks are coupled with each other. And so if block one slides to the left, 
block two drops by the same distance. And so I'm using that fact down here to equate their accelerations. And that allows me to just go ahead and say that these are the accelerations. So from here, you can go ahead and say, okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and have a system where T is equal to M1A, uh, M2G minus T is equal to M2. A, I'll substitute in this value expression for t over here. So this would become m2g minus m1a is equal to m2a. And from there, I can go ahead and solve for acceleration. a is equal to m2g over the sum of the masses, m1 plus m2. And if I need to find the tension, I just go back up here where I have an expression for it. So I'm going to take this acceleration plug it back up there, and get t is equal to m1 m2g over m1 plus m2. Now, that's the gory detail approach. The, there are a lot of shortcuts that you can do if you just think about this. Uh, and a lot of people like to think about this system up here in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the blocks basically having being a connected object with there only being one force kind of pulling on it. And then the tension force kind of cancels out internally. And so you basically have M2G is the force pulling on it and it's accelerating two blocks, M1 and M2. And that's exactly the expression you would derive in that case. All right. Okay. Um, so, Also got asked about eight. Um, this, uh, I'm just gonna cap this briefly. This was also a problem on the midterm. Um, so eight is secret agent Marie Heisenberg. Uh, basically, what's the smallest value of the curve radius you can navigate without slipping? Uh, in this case, you have, this is like a centripetal acceleration problem, or it is a centripetal acceleration problem. Uh, and where Marie is rocketing around uh, here with a speed uh, v. And so there's a centripetal acceleration on this path pointing towards the center with a magnitude v squared over r. That's for, that acceleration has to come from somewhere. And it is kind of weird for a lot of people that that's actually provided by the static friction force. Fs is equal to mac, and that's equal to m v squared over r. Now, uh, and just because there's no other forces that can do it. It is the friction force that's actually pushing her towards the center of the circle on our trajectory here. So given that, uh, we can go ahead and say, all right, so if we have this, can I, oh, cannot erase my rogar. Um, so from here, we say, well, what is my static friction force uh, that it gives me the limiting case? And so then I'm going to go ahead and say that the limiting case on that is mu s times the normal force. Uh, they're in the vertical direction. Uh, she's in equilibrium, so that's equal to mg. And so from here, I can go ahead and substitute that in for my um, uh, friction force, or for my friction force here. So I get that that's mu s mg is equal to m v squared over r. Cancel those out, and I can get an expression for whatever I want. I guess I want the radius, so then r is equal to v squared over mu s uh, g. Yeah, that's the thing. Okay, um, where can we post our problems? Right here in chat. That's where I'm getting all this business from. Okay. Uh, did you come with me? Why? All right. Wow, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Okay. Hmm. So now we've got a neutron star. Uh, all right. So to solve this neutron star problem, we have a mass and a radius and it rotates with a specific rotation period. Uh, what's the equivalent of an astrosynchronous orbit around the neutron star? So this is essentially asking. Uh, Basically, what is the orbital radius so that the period of that orbit is 1.5 seconds? So we have a star down here. The radi this radius is irrelevant. Ignore it. Go away. Uh, it doesn't matter. Only the mass matters. Uh, and that's, so we have a neutron star there. 
We have an orbit in uh, going around it. It's a circle, trust me. And uh, that's the radius we actually care about, how far it is, not the radius of the neutron star at all. And it's going to be going around here every 1.5 seconds. Okay. Uh, so given that, we're going to go ahead and say, well, I know that um, we're going to have to have the orbital period of that. Well, uh, what I need to do is figure out how fast it's going around there. So I start by saying, okay, the speed at which it's on an orbit is how far it goes around the circle. That's the circumference of a circle. So that's a 2 pi times the radius r. And I'm going to divide that by the orbital period which is what's given in the problem. So that t is equal to the 1.5 seconds. So given that, I can say, well, this is the speed that I need. And I have an expression that was derived in gravity for the orbital speed, which is g m over r. Uh, and so from here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve for r in terms of g, m, and t. Uh, in case you're remembering, uh, in case you're wondering where this came from, this, uh, this is the expression where gravity, uh, law of universal gravitation, g little m over big M over r squared, provides the centripetal acceleration on the uh, whatever test particle, mv squared of r. The m's cancel out, and so from there I can get v is equal to g, m over r. Uh, so at this point, I'll square both sides. So I get that that's 4 pi squared r squared over t squared is equal to g m over r. I'll isolate for r. Got some space over here, so I'll use it. Uh, so I get that that's r cubed is g m t uh, squared over 4 pi squared. And so then r is the cube root of that business. gmt squared over 4 pi squared. Anybody get lost along the way? That yeah, looks sort of OK. Uh, so that's how you approach this problem. And so we can plug in mass of the neutron star, the period, Newton's gravitational constant, and your favorite value of pi, and out comes uh, the radius that you'll need. All right. Uh, so a question came up, is this an application of Kepler's law? Yes, you can solve this using Kepler's law, which is equal to uh, t squared is equal to 4 pi squared over g m plus m1 plus m2 m2 times the semi-major axis uh, cubed. Uh, and so what's happening here is um, the We've made the assumption, if we're using the Kepler's law, that A is equal to the radius of the orbit. Oops, that's not the variable I've been using. A is equal to the radius of the orbit. And then we've also assumed that m1 plus m2 is equal to just the mass of the neutron star, because whatever we're in orbit around it is uh, large. Uh, so the question came up basically about how bad my hand handwriting is. This is supposed to be gravitational constant g. Newton's gravity. So that's the g is equal to 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 uh, meter cube per kilogram second squared. OK. Um, OK, so if we weren't given the period of the neutron star, uh, was just given the body it orbits, how would we go about solving for the geosynchronous orbit period? Uh, really, the only thing that matters is the, oh, you, all right. Actually, let me take a step back. The geosynchronous idea uh, is basically saying that the rotation of the star, in this case, is equal to the orbital period. So you can't set up this idea of geosynchronous or astrosynchronous without me telling you the rotation period of the object or the orbital period. If I asked you, basically, this is just a clever way of saying, find the radius of an orbit with period of 1.5 seconds. If I broke the geosynchronous condition, I would still have to tell you the orbital period. It wouldn't necessarily be the orbital rotation period of the object. So we don't actually have to worry too much about uh, that case. Uh, so, yep. All right, so rolling on back up. Um, yeah, so part 12 preview lecture slides. There were some problems at the end of it. I'm sure there were. Um, 
Uh, so these, I think, were some sample problems on the final, uh, or we just sort of discussed uh, some problems on the final. So at the very end, there are several questions here. Mm -hmm. um, I think the one that a lot of people have been asking for in other contexts is, uh, well, I mean, we've sort of have done that. Uh, we'll do, let's do this one. Uh, because we haven't dealt with some problems quite like this. Uh, some of them turn out to be problems we have in fact already done uh, here, uh, but there's something like, Uh, this one. All right. Uh, so this can, uh, this is basically setting up a problem where we have a yo-yo with an outer radius R that is 5.6 times greater than the radius of the axle. So what they're talking about here is this little thing in here. Let's make this big. I need my art space. Uh, so this part here is called is the axle, uh, and then this is the yo-yo itself. So we're going to go ahead and figure out you know, what the uh, radius of that axle is. And so then uh, what we're asking for is basically, uh, if it's an equilibrium, uh, we have a mass suspended from it, find the tension in two strings, T1, T2, and the mass M. So this is a great case of a transference problem because it requires, you know, certainly haven't seen it. And this is again, a static equilibrium uh, problem here with a set of forces. What's kind of uh, interesting about this is that we, uh, so it has, uh, there's multiple masses uh, and a uh, piece of gravity uh, involved. So let's go ahead and draw out what's actually happening. So this is the free body diagram of the yo-yo. We have a force of gravity, mg, pulling down. We're given a mass of 0.1 kilograms. Uh, there's a tension force going up and a tension force pulling down, T2. If we consider the little mass, so this is the yo-yo, for the little mass, if we consider forces on that, um, uh, the, it has a tension force T2 going up and an M little mg going down. I need to make this into a big mg. Bigger, bigger, there we are. Uh, so this is a little mg. So this is basically in equilibrium. So we get something for free. And that is that T2 is equal to mg. Well, not for free, but uh, relatively painlessly. Uh, from here, we can figure out uh, the uh, sum of the forces here. So we know that uh, T1 uh, minus T2 uh, minus mg is equal to uh, zero. So that's telling us that T1 is equal to big M plus little m times g. And that's because one is the weight of the yoke. <sighs> Sorry, this is a big M. This is the mass of the yo-yo. Yeah, big M. That's the mass of the yo-yo. Uh, T2 is the weight of the little weight pulling down. And then that's mg. Well, um, we still need to know the mass of the little uh, mass. Sure sounds like we're going to have to deal with a uh, torque problem at this point. Uh, so for this case, I'm going to consider the uh, sum of the torques from, I don't know, what's a good place to consider the sum of the torques from? Eh, I'll do the center of the object here. I can't remember the algebra of this problem, so I don't know whether this is a terrible choice or not. So I'll consider this, uh, the center of the yo-yo to be the origin of the torques. Am I good with that? I don't know. All right, so that's the origin for torques will be the center. So if I have that as the origin for the torque, I can write down uh, the three torques involved. Uh, so the first is the mass of the yo-yo, that's mg. It's acting at zero moment arm, so it goes away. Uh, then there's a positive torque from the tension force, T1 times the little radius. And then we get a negative torque from the second tension uh, times the big radius. And so that is also equal to zero. We have an expression up here for the um, 
uh, tension for the force one. That's m plus m, big M plus little m times g uh, times r is equal to, I'm going to, this term is zero. I'm going to push this to the other side and say that that's equal to little m g times the big R. And so from here, I have to isolate for uh, big M, so, or little m, little m is where we're going. So it's big M g r is equal to uh, little m g times big R minus little r. Fortunately, this is an expression that's given in the uh, uh, problem. So feeling good about life right now. Uh, and so m is equal to big M times R over uh, big R minus little r. And I can go ahead and use the expression that's given in the top, which is uh, I'm going to go ahead and divide the top and bottom of this compound fraction by r. So I'm going to get that this is m times 1 over uh, big R over little r minus m minus 1. And the reason why I do that whole mess is that it says the outer radius is 5.6 times larger than, uh, than the radius of the axle. So that means basically that this expression here is equal to 5.6. So then I now know that m is equal to, uh, it's m times 1 over 4.6. And that's math that I can't do, but I do know what big M is. So I have found little m, and I can flow back all the way to do the tensions. All right. Uh, so that's how we would solve that problem. It's another good statics uh, problem. Simply the best statics problems. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, All right. I uh, got a question about can I repeat the torque? Uh, so the cases with the torque problem, uh, just I'll rehash really quickly. Uh, so I'm considering the origin of the torque to be here. And so what I have is I have an mg acting at the center of the yo-yo. I have a distance uh, r. I have the tension force going up, t1. And then I have at distance uh, big R, I have the tension force t2 going down. And so then I can go ahead and uh, use this for the sum of the torques. I've picked this to be the origin. And so if I pick that to be the origin, the weight force, the weight torque goes away. Again, that's a big M. Uh, and then I get a positive torque from this uh, pushing up, 90 degree angle between them. So I didn't consider the sine term. And then there's a 90 degree angle here. It's negative because it's in the clockwise direction going down there uh, for going down there uh, to at, at moment arm of R. Okay, so I think that uh, there was a second problem in the uh, um, pre part 12 lecture slides about the rod. Yeah. So I was mostly dealing with this in the context of uh, classification of problems, because the important thing in the final is you're seeing everything from all over the course. And the hardest problem is really, what are we talking, where is this from? Is this energy, is this mass, is it whatever? Uh, and that's the hard part, is just classification. So the thing that you'll want to do as you're sort of going through this is to actually work on uh, looking at problems and recognizing what they are. Now, so, uh, if you, have time and access to like a printer or something. Uh, you might wanna take some problems from the back of your book uh, or from the different chapters, uh, copy them, cut them up, and then shuffle them among the chapters. Cause that's the hard part. You don't know where they come from. Uh, the practice, quiz, the practice content quiz stuff can give you a bit of that insight, uh, but in general, you wanna work on classification. Uh, so this was an example that I was going to go over in lecture about classifying the problem, but we can actually talk about this for the full physics deal, which is a thin uniform rod and uh, with a uh, length and a mass is suspended and pivoted and it is around, allowed to swing down without friction. What we want to know is the tangential speed of its free end at the bottom. 
If we look at this problem, it's an extended mass of object. So this means that we are clearly working with something that is at least chapter 10 and 11 uh, there. So that's the only case we dealt with extended massive objects, the rotation part. It's rotating, so that's a good sign. Now the question is, can we deal with this with uh, energy or do we need to deal with this with torques? So when I look through this problem and I'm hoping, really hoping I can deal with this with energy, what I need to do is see whether it has any question about time. That's usually the hallmark. If I see time, I'm gonna have to go into torques, but I don't. So there's no time. And it's all about speeds and positions. So this means that energy is a good strategy here. So let's hope that works, especially because we have a before and after. We have an omega equals zero, we have an omega here. This is, energy's looking great. So I'm, I'm, I'm betting, I'm gonna select my e-poll answer for rotational energy and hope that, I really hope that works. Okay. Um, Oh, exciting times. We have a small metal ball of mass one kilogram down here on the end. I'm gonna draw that in. Uh, so when the rod is vertical, what's the tangential speed of the free end? So I can go ahead and say, uh, this is an energy. So I'm gonna say energy final minus energy initial is equal to the non-conservative work done on the system. No friction or air resistance. So this is going to be zero. Uh, so I can set my final energy equal to my initial energy. Uh, why does time indicate that is a torque question? Uh, it's a good, uh, good question um, because when we get torques, we're going to have to do uh, problems with accelerations and use our kinematic equations, either angular or linear. Uh, the specific thing is if you see time, it rules out energy. Energy can't deal with times. Um, so we, we basically lose access to our best, uh, our best uh, tool. And so we have to fall back to dealing with, you know, energy or eh, maybe angular momentum. Anyways, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, the final energy and the uh, initial energy are equal. And so I'm going to start this up here and I'm going to pick a zero point for my potential energy. I'm going to set it at the top, which is a little weird, but that's because both of the masses that I have to consider sit up here at uh, zero. So this is my zero point for, connect, for energy, for energy. So that means that my potential energy, my initial energy, and my kinetic energy are both zero. Uh, zero, zero. And so that's because I've picked my zero point for potential energy up there. I can pick it anywhere I want. Um, and so what I have to do is consider uh, the, I, I, so I, I, I just picked that point for the beginning uh, because we have two things dropping here. So we have a uh, final potential energy and there's going to be a final gravitational potential energy and there's going to be the kinetic energy that's final. Uh, and that's going to be zero, just given the way I've set this up. So the gravitational potential energy is going to be, uh, well, first off, I'm gonna have this ball drop in with mass 2m. So I'm going to say that that's going to fall from zero down to the length of the rod. So it has dropped to minus big M uh, g times the length of the rod. So it drops down that far. Uh, then I have the rod is going to fall down and the center of mass is helpfully indicated here on the problem. The center of mass is what we use as the point for an object falling uh, for gravitational potential energy. So the rod itself has dropped from potential energy MGL over two. Okay, so from here, I finally have the kinetic energy and this is a rotating object. Uh, so we're going to say that it's going to have a, math, uh, a rotation energy that is one half I omega squared. And again, this is all equal to zero. So we're doing pretty well here. Uh, this stuff looks like it's, these are all values that we have in the problem. Uh, and we need to get at what the omega is. This is a little tricky because this is a compound object. So I have to go ahead and I look up what the moments of inertia are. So the moment of inertia of a compound object is the sum of its parts. Uh, it's the rod part uh, plus the moment of inertia for the ball. The rod has an expression in the back of the, on the back of the formula sheet. And I think it's one third 
m, oh, oh geez, uh, little m, because it's the mass of the rod. Oh, uh, freaky time. Just let me erase my thing, please, Microsoft. All right. Uh, well, I'm going to fix this by obliterating all the things. Oh, now, mother puss bucket. All right. One third ml squared. All right. Where were we? Oh, yes. We were putting a ball on the end of it. No, I, I'm an idiot. This is little m. All that for nothing. Because that's the mass of the rod. One third ml squared. M L squared is the moment of inertia of the ball. So this is basically a point mass at the end of the uh, rod. You might ask, well, what if the uh, ball had some radius? We didn't cover those kind of problems here. Uh, we're going to assume it's a small ball, so we're going to treat it as a point mass. So this gives us the uh, moments of inertia for the two components, and I can just plug that in here. And now I have absolutely everything I need to figure out what the uh, uh, what the angular speed is down at the bottom. So this is minus mg over L. This is, I'm going to use the substitution that this is just 2m so I can avoid uh, future uh, lack of distinction between my um, big m's and little m's. So this is minus 2 little m g L minus uh, 1 half m g L plus 1 half and then I'm going to go ahead and substitute in my expression here, uh, one third ml squared uh, plus uh, two ml squared. And again, that two m is because I've substituted big M for two m, and that's omega squared is equal to zero. And I'll go ahead and solve that for omega squared. So I'm going to get that omega squared is equal to uh, two five halves m g l divided by the moment of inertia term, which is going to be one sixth m l squared uh, plus two little m l squared. And I can math that's 13 sixths. So this becomes six thirteenths times five halves times m g l over m L squared. And just for completeness sake, we'll cancel those out. And we'll get that that's a nice rip roaring 15 thirteenths. Cancel the M's, cancel an L. Uh, so we're left with uh, 15 G over 13 L as the angular speed. And then I asked, uh, what the vertical, what is the tangential speed of its free uh, of the, oh, I have to take the square root um, to actually figure out what omega is. So omega is the square root of 15 g over 13 l. And then the tangential speed is going to be omega l. So because it's the length l, it's rotating at uh, angular speed omega, so a point at the end is just omega L, and so then that is equal to L times the square root of 15 G over 13 L. Okay. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, so, um, let's see here. A uh, couple good questions in the chat. So let's see here. Can we get a uh, repeat where I got each component of the energy from? Yeah, so that's uh, the question in uh, the, the question is uh, focusing on this equation. This first part is big M G L. That's the dropping, uh, that's the potential energy that's liberated from the ball at the end. Uh, so goes from here down to here, so it drops the distance L. So it's minus big MGL. So it's just MGH for the object, where H is L in this case. Uh, the little mg L over 2 is a little bit harder because the center of mass is there at the center of the, um, uh, of the rod. And so it has dropped by a distance of L over 2 to get to this point. So it only falls that much. And so that's important for extended objects. 
the gravitational potential energy you consider is where the center of mass moves to. And then the final part is one half I omega squared, uh, which is just the moment of inertia of, uh, moment of inertia for the system. Uh, okay, so then, um, given that, um, okay, so that's where the energy components come from. Why isn't the moment of inertia for a rod uh, one third m l over two squared? And I believe that that's just the way we've defined it, is that if it's, uh, if it's um, spun around the middle, it's one third m l over two squared. Uh, in this case, it's the rod spun around the end, so that's a one third m l squared. And those are treated as two different cases in uh, chapter 10's tables of the moment of inertia, also appearing on your formula sheet like that. Um, and so why did we not choose torque? Uh, the secret answer is that you can't solve this problem uh, if you use torque. Uh, it's like one of those problems that is literally not solvable. Uh, and the reason is, is that at a certain point, let's say part way down here, uh, you're going to have gravity pulling on the ball at the end. And you also are going to have uh, gravity pulling down here. And the torque from gravity, if I think about this, is going to be, I'm going to have to define an angle theta. Uh, we'll call that, mm, that's, let's, let's call, I don't know, uh, something like this angle here, theta, as it drops. Uh, and in that case, we, if we draw gravity, no, forget it. Let's call that angle theta. Makes my point either way. If that's theta, then the torque is going to be, torque would be the length of the rod over two times the weight times the sine of that angle theta. This means that you have an equation where the acceleration depends on the angle. We haven't solved those problems. And in fact, no one in physics has learned how to solve those problems. Uh, this is an impossible to solve problem. So that's a great reason not to use torques in this particular problem. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So I think that's what I wanted to say about that. Okay. All right. Cha -cha -cha. Oh. Yeah, so would I advise you to use energy instead of torque wherever possible? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, energy is definitely the best solution technique uh, that we have. If you have a, so you're looking for, uh, you want one thing, which is a before and after scenario. Here it is before, here it is after. Uh, and then you want to make sure there is no time at time t equals zero here, at time t equals five here, then you're going energy. That just sort of sets it all up uh, for you. Okay, let's see here. Um, okay, uh, question came up as such, which is uh, solid ball with mass radius distance uh, by an angle, uh, distance down the ramp is inclined by an angle with respect to the horizontal. At the bottom of the ramp was the rotational kinetic entry. This is, uh, this is a foundational problem, which is why I asked it like 30 different ways on the content quizzes. So I got a ball, I got an angle theta, whoops. And it's rolling on down here. So it rolls without slipping uh, down the ramp. And it rolls, but it travels a distance. What's given is the distance here, uh, d. Now, the amount of energy it has at the bottom is released from gravitational potential energy. So we know that the kinetic energy at the bottom is equal to the gravitational potential energy at the top. That's, that's the one on the left is not a letter, sir. All right, there we are. Um, so that is uh, the gravitational potential energy. And that's equal to mgh, which is equal to mgd sine theta. So this is the total kinetic energy. And the total kinetic energy is going to be split into two parts. It has a translational component, which is basically how much energy is associated with the center of mass moving down the ramp. And it also has a rotational component. And this is what we're after in this particular problem. All of this is liberated from the same energy. 
Some flavors of this problem ask, what's the total kinetic energy? And this is just MGD sine theta. You would stop right there. I don't have to care how I split it up. I don't have to figure out what the budget is. The budget is set by the moment of inertia of the system and the rolling without slipping criterion. So the kinetic energy from translation is just one half mv squared. That's same kinetic energy we always have. And the kinetic energy from rotation is uh, one half i omega squared, totally. So, the, so with the one half i omega squared, uh, we also have the final ro uh, relationship, which is v is equal to r omega. And so what we're going to do is we're going to substitute in omega is equal to v over r into this particular component here. So this is equal to one half uh, moment of inertia times v squared over r squared. And uh, then I'm going to go ahead and say, all right, given now that I'm armed with expressions for this, I'm going to return up here to my energy expression and figure out how to solve for all of these things. So I can go ahead and say, all right, the kinetic, uh, the, then I'm going to have that one half m v squared is equal to, oh, uh, is not equal to anything. It's um, going to be equal to, it's going to be added to one half um, uh, plus one half i v squared. I'm going to put the r under the i for later. And that, that's equal to m g d sine theta. Now I'm going to do a trick here, which is I'm going to pull out the one half m v squared uh, from both terms. So if I do that, I get that this is one uh, plus the half comes out, the v squared comes out, the uh, and I'm left with this expression one half i over m r squared is equal to m g d sine theta. And what you'll see is that this is set, this is basically setting the moment of inertia. So this first part here is the translation factor, and this is the rotation factor. And so this thing in brackets is telling us how the kinetic energy sort of splits, the budget splits into the, kinetic, the translational and the rotational component. Now throughout the class, I've been calling this ratio I over MR squared, I've been sort of defining it to be this number beta. If you're wondering where the hell all the betas are coming from, this is it. It's the moment of inertia divided by MR squared. And that's because a, what kind of ball do we have today? A solid ball has a moment of inertia of I, which is equal to, two-fifths mr squared. So when I divide by mr squared, then I'm getting a beta that's equal to two-fifths. So with that beta uh, of two-fifths, it's just the number in front of the mr squared in a moment of inertia. Uh, so therefore, the uh, kinetic energy is, or the, the uh, kinetic energy is going to, the translational is one-half m v squared, and then the translational is beta is equal to one half m v squared, and that's equal to m g d sine theta. I'm going through this in gory detail, um, just in hopes to kind of fill in some of the pieces of how we've been solving these problems. Uh, so the fraction here is uh, basically saying that the rotation, uh, this, this one plus beta term, it says that the fraction of energy, fraction of energy in translational is equal to the term that's translation divided by the total. This is basically one over one plus beta. Uh, and the fraction in the rotation is just the beta over one plus beta. So, so this is the fraction in rotation is beta over one plus beta. So this says that there's actually a fairly straightforward answer to this problem, which is the rotational energy is just beta over one plus beta times the potential energy that's liberated. And that's equal to two fifths over one plus two fifths. 
uh, times the gravitational potential energy, or two-fifths over uh, seven-fifths, uh, which ends up uh, being two-sevenths mgd sine theta. All right. Okay, so a question comes up, but how does that work when I equals mr squared? So wouldn't it cancel itself out? Well, in that case, uh, the beta factor is just one. So that's equal to I over mr squared. And so uh, that's equal to mr squared over mr squared. And so that's one. And so if I go up here, then this fraction basically says that the rotational fraction uh, is going to be one over one plus one, which is is a half. And then the translation is going to be uh, one over one plus one is also a half. So that means that if it's a hoop sliding down the ramp or rolling down the ramp, then you get half as goes into potential, uh, into rotation and half goes into translation. So you get basically a 50-50 split between the energies. Uh, sometimes you get a weird object where it isn't in this form of like number mr squared. And in that case, it's just the moment of inertia divided by its mass over radius squared. And you sort of calculate, you sort of fake a beta uh, from that case. All right. Hmm. Trying to find my, sp my spot here. Okay. Uh, can you do one of the loudspeaker broadcasting out of phase ca uh, uh, cases? Um, sure. Is this Max and Planck one? Uh, okay, sure. Okay. Looking at this and reading it more carefully, I think I answered this incorrectly recently. So let's see if I can fix this. Uh, okay, so this was a problem from definitely a final exam that I've given some time. Uh, so this was two loudspeakers separated by a distance of 18.5 meters and broadcast a pure tone out of phase. Two people, Max and Planck, stand on a line between the two speakers separated by a distance of 1.30 meters. Max hears the tone clearly and Planck can't hear the tone at all. What is the frequency of the tone? Assume the speed of sound is 343 meters per second. So uh, this is a case where we have one loudspeaker, and we have another loudspeaker, and they're broadcasting waves out of phase, which means when they're out of phase, uh, we are set up with a criterion that if the path difference between two people is equal to an integer number of wavelengths, that leads to destructive interference. And this is from the out of phase criterion because out of phase. And if the path difference uh, from one speaker, uh, this uh, the listener to the other is a half integer number of wavelengths, then we get constructive interference. So this says that of these two people, Max is standing so that the bottom criterion is true and Planck is standing so that the top criterion is true. And so that means that somewhere along here is Max and somewhere else along here is Planck. And they are separated by some number of wavelengths. And our goal is to use the information in the problem to figure out how many wavelengths that is and then figure out the frequency of the tone that's broadcast. So uh, the big thing that we're given is we're told that the total distance here is 18.5 meters. And since we're told that it's 18.5 meters, we're going to solve for where uh, Max and Planck are uh, and relate it to these conditions. So we go ahead and say, well, Max is here. I need a variable, so I'm going to define one. I'll call that x. And so I'm going to say that the path difference for max is going to be delta L is going to be the distance from one speaker. It's the absolute value of X minus the distance from the other speaker, which is going to be 
uh, 18.5 minus x. So that's this other part here is going to be the 18.5 minus x. And so this is going to come here. So that's 18.5 minus x. All in absolute values, so distribute the negative sign, and we end up with an expression that's going to be 2x minus 18.5 is basically what the path, uh, could, the path difference criterion is giving us. And because max is hearing constructive interference, uh, then that's going to be equal to some half integer number of wavelengths. I might have said that wrong earlier. It's getting late. Uh, can I explain how I created this equation? Yeah, so I'm calculating what the path difference is uh, for max. So when I say path difference, that is the difference of the distances to the two speakers. So this first term here is the distance to the left speaker, as I've drawn it. And then the right term here is the distance to the right uh, speaker. So the total distance is 18.5 between them. And so the interval here is 18.5 uh, minus x. So this is the distance to the right. So that's what I'm doing here. So this gives me basically what the path difference is. And then the criterion that max is, here's the tone clearly because of constructive interference and they are said to be broadcasting a pure tone out of phase, then, yeah, I definitely solved this wrong on Piazza because uh, I did the in phase case. Anyways, um, then we go ahead and say that then we're going to use the constructive interference for out of phase, which is a half wavelength path difference. So again, remember the whole goal for our approach is to figure out what the wavelength is. Uh, and from there, we'll figure out the frequency just using the relationship between wavelength frequency and speed of sound. Okay, uh, so for Planck, we're gonna do the same thing. So Planck is going to be, we don't know where uh, Planck is, but we know that he is 1.3 meters from max. So I'm gonna use the same variable. And I know that this distance here is going to be the 1.3 meters. So max to Planck is 1.3 meters. Uh, should we memorize that out of phase is n lambda and in phase is n plus a half lambda? I don't remember if that's given on the formula sheet or not. If not, then uh, yes. Um, uh, okay, so then, um, there we have delta L, and here we're going to say that, oh, uh, Planck is going to be x plus 1.3 meters, as I've drawn it. So x plus an additional 1.3 meters will get us to Planck. So Planck is 1.3 meters plus x from the left speaker. I'm going to subtract off the similar expression, 18.5 minus x uh, minus 1.3. That's, or rather, here I'll be a little careful. That's x plus 1.3 with a negative sign applying to everything, which I've got to distribute in. And if I do a little bit of math, I'm going to end up with, again, a 2x negative negative plus 1.3 minus negative 1.3 is plus 2.6 minus 18.5. Uh, so if it was plus 2.5 minus 18.5, that'd be minus 16. Uh, so that'd be minus 15.9. Uh, I'm feeling like that's a number. All right, uh, yeah. There we are. Okay, um, okay, so question came up. If waves are in phase, is the opposite case where the destructive is n plus a half lambda? Yes, and this is the default case is the in phase, which is why I just blindly went ahead and solved for that in uh, the Piazza case without really reading the problem carefully. And that's the kind of thing that earned me all kinds of Bs when I was in physics. So, um, all right, so we go ahead and we have um, uh, these two expressions here for n plus a half wavelength and 2x minus 15.9 is n wavelengths. We don't know what n is, but we do know that they are separated by some value. I should also note that this is not necessarily the same as the, the n's are uh, not there. So shouldn't the n's cancel out? I don't, I, I, let's see here. 
negative, negative. So we distribute the negative twice. So it should carry the two uh, now. So I think we've distributed in two negatives. So it'll come out with a positive. Okay. So then uh, the difference. Uh, so then we are left with these uh, two equations. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and drop the absolute value sign. And the reason that I can do that is I might get an answer that is negative, and that just means that I should have, you know, treated it as a positive. So I'm going to go ahead and drop the absolute value signs and say that we're solving for one particular case, um, 2x minus 15.9 is equal to n prime lambda. And we also know that 2x uh, minus 18.5 is equal to n plus a half times lambda. And so from here, I can go ahead and subtract these two equations because I don't actually care about what the x is. I only want to get at what my wavelength is. So I'm going to go ahead and subtract these two equations. And so if I do that, I get back to the 2.6 is equal to uh, n prime minus n minus a half times lambda. And then we go ahead and we say, all right, so there's, this is a, these are integers, um, and I don't know exactly what those integers are, uh, but they go ahead and they give me a result. I'm going to restore my units now. And then this lambda, I'm going to go ahead and replace with a CS minus uh, over F, which is the speed of sound. Uh, CS over F, uh, which is 2.6 meters. And I'm going to go ahead and solve for F. So this is 343 meters per second over uh, 2.6 meters um, times n prime minus n minus a half. So this is basically a half integer. It's going to be equal to uh, one half, three halves, three halves, five halves, etc. We don't know what it is, but it's one of those things. And at this point, and the reason why I felt guilty about this as a prof after giving the exam is it isn't the one half case. It is, ends up being the three halves case, I think, uh, which is basically uh, you have to check all the possible combinations against the answers and you find out that the answer is uh, this value. If I had a calculator and patience and a bunch, uh, then a bunch of time, we would go through it. And, uh, but for now, that's the basic approach. Uh, the important point is just has just been asked is uh, why are the two n not the same? Uh, the two n not the same is uh, because they weren't they don't necessarily uh, they aren't necessarily the same. Uh, basically, I said what is the frequency of the tone? So that means it could put any number of wavelengths between max and Planck. It could be a half a wavelength, three halves a wavelength, five halves a wavelength, whatever. Uh, and we don't know what it is. I mean, I kind of solved this in gory detail, but you know if they are standing 1.3 meters apart, uh, that 1.3, uh, the, the, that ends up being um, uh, some fraction of numbers of wavelengths. So we can go ahead and uh, sort of step out and figure out how many wavelengths are packed in there. Most of the time, I will say, what is the minimum frequency? And that automatically sets the ends to be the same and sort of specifies that these really have to be equal um, in, they, they have to be uh, one half a wavelength apart, uh, which allows you to solve the problems a little bit more efficiently rather than doing this guess and check approach. Ah, not on the formula sheet. Well, um, that is a problem. So, yeah, so, uh, sorry. Um, yes, so please uh, do remember that uh, the physics fact that constructive interference for in phase speakers happens when your path differences are half or a full wavelength and destructive is half a wavelength flipped for out of phase. Uh, is this the hardest type of equation we would expect? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think um, some people find the case where they uh, two broadcasters are often a triangle a little harder just because the math gets a little hairier uh, for that. This is this 
when they're on the line, I find the reasoning in the physics is murderous. Um, when it's off, the math is harder, but the reasoning is a little bit more clear, uh, generally. Okay, let's see here. Ta -ta -ta. All right. Um, so let's see here. Rob, yeah, I'm just checking. In fact, we should probably, I'm just flipping back through here and seeing what we have. Um, yeah, there is one type of problem that we haven't talked much about that I think would be worth uh, discussing, and that's an interference pattern. Um, there's a couple more in here that I think are good, but I am running out of time. Um, so, Sorry, where was it? Uh, Where's the interference pattern? Ah, here. Sample file of question 11. Oh, I think that's the, um, that's the qualitative one. Yeah, no, no. Oh yeah, this is a good one. Uh, question, when you're sub in one house, five has three halves, what are you subbing it in for? Uh, that's the, what I'm subbing in for is for um, the possible values of two, uh, n minus n minus a half. I know that n, uh, n and n prime are integers. And so therefore, uh, if I take a difference of two integers and then subtract a half off of it, I know that that value has to be a half, three halves, five halves, seven halves, et cetera. So that's uh, basically checking all the cases for what n could be. All right. Uh, so the problem that I thought would be good to discuss is uh, this one, uh, which is uh, basically, oh, Basically hard to make bigger. There we are. Okay, uh, so this shows an interference pattern produced by a laser shining through a pair of slits with a, a specified slit separation. Uh, the width is labeled, width between labeled is 8.5 centimeters, uh, project on a screen distance. What is the wavelength of the laser light? So this uses um, the expression of uh, d sine theta is equal to n lambda, which basically says d is the slit separation, n is some number of wavelengths, um, and then lambda is the wavelength of light, and sine theta is the angle that's formed between the two slits and the projection on the screen. So we'll take that as a right triangle, that's a theta, your two slits are over here, that's a D, and this is some distance L. Here's the dirty little trick on this problem, is that you can sort of wrap your head around, well, what's the center of the uh, interference pattern? But because all of the angles are really small, we don't really have to worry about what is the center and what is the edge. All you have to know in this case is going from a dark spot to a bright spot is a half a wavelength. So I can just count off what this is. So this is a dark spot to bright spot is a half, back to a dark spot is one, uh, three halves, two, uh, uh, three halves, yeah, so three halves, um, I can do this, two, uh, five halves. So um, yeah, so I did something dumb down here, ignore it. Um, anyways, so we can go ahead and say, all right, uh, so this is going to be, did I do that right? No. One, two, three. I can count to three, seriously. Uh, so this tells us that the number of wavelengths difference uh, corresponding to L is just going to be three. So it tells us that three, this is three lambda. 
uh, is equal to d sine theta. What are we solving for anyways? Ah, the laser light. Uh, so we're finding lambda. So we can just go ahead and say that lambda is equal to d over 3 sine theta. And then we go ahead and say, OK, what's the separation between the slits? 45 microns specified. And then we have that the length L is 8.5 centimeters, and the distance is 2.3 meters. So this is saying that this is 0 0.085 meters, and then this is 2.3 meters. OK. Um, so from there, we go ahead and say, well, sine theta is basically uh, d over 3 times L. And you can figure this out as the hypotenuse, which is uh, L squared plus uh, whatever we'll call that x squared square root. Uh, this turns out to basically just be x uh, because L is so tiny compared to x. And so then you get that this is d uh, L over 3x. So that would just be all you plug in and out will come the, oh, looks like it's yellow light. Exciting time. Um, let's see here. Oh, question about the last one. Should we be expect this kind of question for the final or will we just be dealing with minimum frequency? Um, le legalistically, I'm, uh, or lawyerly, I'm obligated to say that you could expect this kind of problem on the final. Um, sort of in a sort of more general sense, I felt guilty about giving this particular case and didn't think it was really a best way to sort of examine whether people know physics. So make of that what you will. Um, okay. So let's see here. There were a couple more that I thought were uh, worth touching on. Um, sample final question 14. Uh, so, uh, Reasonable question, how does diffraction pattern change as the frequency of light increases? Uh, so what's going to happen is if the frequency of light increases, uh, this is a great conceptual question. Uh, so if the frequency goes up, that, uh, that's an arrow. Frequency goes up, then the wavelength goes down. That's because uh, the C over F is equal to the wavelength, big F little lambda. Uh, so what that means is that d sine theta is always true, is equal to n lambda. So what happens is lambda, this gets smaller. So that means that d sine theta has to get smaller. So d sine theta has to decrease. d is fixed. It's a property of the slits uh, of the separation or of the slit separation of the apparatus. It doesn't change. So sine theta must get smaller. So that means sine theta gets smaller. Sine theta is corresponding to this angle, where over here is the interference pattern. So what's happening here is that the uh, L distance in this problem is going to shrink. So L is going to drop. And that means that your uh, pattern is going to go from kind of looking like this. This is an intensity versus position graph. Um, and it's going to kind of scrunch up. And so the angular, it basically is going to become smaller and tighter together. And the separations between the interference minima and maxima will become smaller. OK. Um, yeah. Is there a cylinders or torques problem? Did that. All right. I actually like this one because it's a throwback to stuff we haven't thought about in a while. But the final is one is basically cumulative, and we design it by going through the 12 main weeks of the course and picking, make sure that there's kind of three questions on each. Uh, so that's sort of where it falls out, you know, some. Uh, so it's worth going back to the chapter four stuff just to remember. So uh, the equations of motion of an object are x is one meter per second squared, and y is two meters minus three meters per second times t, where the x and y components of the initial position, velocity, and acceleration. So what you want to do is you want to sort of take these equations. So x is equal to uh, one meter per second squared times t squared. And I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this as x in terms of my constant acceleration expression, v0 x t plus 1 half a 
t squared. And you just make an association here. You look for a term over here without a t. Oh, there is none. There's only this one. So that tells us that my initial exposition is zero. And I go ahead and say, oh, where's the term with only a t, not a t squared? There is none. So x naught is equal to zero, v zero x also equal to zero. And then we know that a sub x is equal to one half a is one meter per second squared. So that means that the two meter per second squared. So that's the acceleration in the x direction. We can do a similar trick lining up the y, which is equal to uh, two meters minus three meters per second uh, times t. And then uh, we're going to say, okay, this y is equal to y naught uh, plus v zero y. Uh, plus one half a sub y t squared. And we can go ahead and do that and say, all right, um, given all of that, I can make the expression that zero, why not? And we'll line up here with the two meters. So far, so good. Uh, v zero y is the number in front of the t. Uh, that's that part. So that's minus three meters per second. And then the acceleration in the y direction is just zero. So that's how you would solve a nice problem where you're just given the equations of motion and asked to kind of make sense of the different pieces there. Let's plank, rod, okay. Um, all right. I'm going to do uh, this torque qualitative question, and I'll do a rod, and then I've got to call it because it's about time for dinner. Uh, okay, so this is uh, sample final question 14. Let's see if I can actually find it. Oh, I can. Sweet. Um, all right. Okay, so shows an axle with a cylinder. Which force exerts the largest positive torque? Assume R2 is greater than R1. So we can, uh, we can do a few things. First is basically rule out anything that is exerting a negative torque. Uh, so that's going to be things that are pulling this around in a counterclockwise direction. And so that's, uh, this is a bad one. That's FA. It's straight out of the running. And then we're looking for things that are pulling it around counterclockwise. Uh, all the forces have equal magnitudes, and so the torque is going to have a value of torque is equal to F, which is all the same thing, times the length over which they are acting, times the sine of the angle between the moment arm and the force vector. So um, if we go through and look at this, it's, uh, we can sort of say, all right, uh, let's work on, uh, let's just work alphabetically, FB. So uh, let's see here, FB is going up like that. If we draw the moment arm from the center of the axle out to the vector, it's going uh, like maybe they're lined up, probably shouldn't be, but it's about the same thing. There's a tiny little angle there of phi, and so this is going to be uh, tau sub b, is going to be F times R1 times the sine of a tiny angle. So sine of, I don't know, 10 degrees or something small. Uh, but the point is, this is tiny. So that torque's going to be lame. Uh, and by lame, I mean small and probably not in the running. So let's see here, torque uh, C. Torque C is the same force, but it's acting at twice the radius. So R2 is 2R1. So this is going to be times 2r1. And if I draw the moment arm down here, you'll see it hits the force at a 90 degree angle. So it's got a moment arm down. It's got a force going that way, 90 degree angle between them. So it's sine of 90 degrees. And so that's 2fr1, looking good. Turns out that's the answer. Uh, the only one we have to worry about now is we'll do e real quick, which is f times r1 because it's acting at the center cylinder here. Again, a 90 degree angle. So that's the torque for E. And then for D, it's going to be uh, not a 90 degree angle. So it goes up here. It looks like it's hitting at about a 45 degree angle. So we have a moment arm comes up. We have a force going out. And so this is about a 45 degree angle. And so we can go ahead and calculate uh, that. 
as basically 2FR1 sine 45 degrees. And the important thing about math is sine 45 is less than sine 90. Uh, and so this is going to mean that tau D is less than tau C. So tau C is our winner and indeed uh, the answer to the problem. Last one, uh, why did we cross out force A? It's because it's acting in the clockwise direction. So it will be a negative torque. Uh, so I'll just say this is negative. And scumbag prof asked for the largest positive torque. Man, what a jerk. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, for two open ends of a pipe, number of nodes equals harmonic. What would be the case for a pipe with one open and one closed end? Uh, so this is a case where we uh, have, I don't know, uh, reminds me of a lab setup that we did sometime. Uh, so in this case, uh, what you need to have with a one open, one closed end is you have to have a node here, and you have to have an anti-node here. And so the question really just comes down to, uh, uh, and if this is the length of the pipe, what kind of waves can you pack in here that meet this criteria? And so the obvious, uh, the, the simplest wave is one where, uh, uh, drawing has always been my hard part. So uh, basically you get a minimum at one end and then it comes up to a maximum at the other. And this is a part of a wave that basically goes for, uh, goes up to a maximum, comes down, drops again, and then it goes back up. So this turns out to be a quarter wavelength. So you can basically, uh, for all these pipe problems, the standing wave criterion is setting up a case where the uh, geometry of the pipe is related to the number of wavelengths that you can pack into here. So for the one end open, one end closed case, you end up with the pipe has to have a length that is a quarter wavelength, or it turns out that you can then, the next wavelength that you can pack up it has one crossing and it comes out, so it's an anti-node. Uh, so then the next one up is three lambda over four, and then the next one is five lambda over four, et cetera. Uh, so you end up with these being the relationships for the relation. Uh, that's basically setting the gradient. It's always the length of the pipe. Uh, and so if you flip that around, you can figure out that the nth uh, harmonic that you can pack in there is equal to four times the length of the pipe over um, n. And then the, you always, with these, you use the relationship for the speed of sound uh, I, over the wavelength n is the nth harmonic. And so then you just get a nth, uh, you get that expression from there. Uh, the key point here is that n is odd in that case. Uh, question is lab including every score, will it drop the lowest score? Uh, we dropped the lowest of everything but the lab six revisions. So you get um, one of the things that's worth 10% gets dropped from your score. Uh, we, uh, Really, you should have final lap marks integrated into the lecture component of E-Class by tomorrow. Uh, so you will know uh, what that came out, but it should be the number at the bottom of your E-Class labs book. Okay, I think, um, I think I've hit the highlights of what I wanted to cover. Uh, for those of you who are in AO2, uh, good luck on your exam tomorrow. Um, Y'all are going to nail it. I've seen your exam. It's a good exam. We're proud to be a part of it. Uh, good luck. And the uh, other thing is if you're in AO1 and you don't have a final tomorrow morning, you can come see me do a similar sort of exercise in CSIS 1-440, and we'll see you there. Uh, you're welcome very much. It's always a pleasure talking to you all, uh, or it's always a pleasure texting with you all and uh, randomly spouting physics at my laptop. So good luck. Take care with the rest of your studying and get some sleep. And now I'll pivot over to what looks like 40 questions on Piazza. It's going to be a good night. All right. Uh, see you all later.